take a minute to introduce both our panelists today because um, they both come with rich diversities in terms of education and professional experience. So I'll start with the Professor Keith uh, McWither first. He is career coach at Technology Innovation Entrepreneurship Department, Smith School of Business, Queens University. Um, Mr. McWither is a career coach whose passion is to connect people to services, knowledge, and each other in order to help them achieve their goals. With the focus of, on innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship, um, Keith supports students who are interested in pursuing career journeys and pivots into these industries and functional roles. He is a highly energetic leader and collaborative team member who thrives in environments of development and change. He has over 25 years of business development and customer relationship management experience, spanning both private and public sectors, encompassing a diverse range of industries. Uh, he is a Queen's Executive MBA 2016 alumni and also a faculty member at Smith School of Business in the Commerce Program. Thank you so much for joining us. An honor, thank you so much. Uh, moving on to Professor Ram B. Ramachandran, uh, who is a professor of practice and vice dean at Jindal School of Banking and Finance, OP Jindal Global University. Uh, he teaches management, leadership, entrepreneurship, and emerging technologies. His current research interest includes government policies on education, impact of edtech in educational uh, pedagogy, and transformative nature of AI and fintech across industries. He's an accomplished, handsome senior executive with over 35 years track record on building and leading global information management practices, high growth businesses, and high performing teams as well. Most recently, he was the managing director at Ernest & Young, New York, responsible for driving data and analytics, robotics process automation, and telematics solutions for his clients. Uh, he's currently pursuing his PhD. Uh, his, his research focuses on intersection of technology, entrepreneurship, and education. He holds an MBA from the Stern School of Business at NYU, Bachelor's of Engineering from the University of Madras, and certifications in FinTech from MIT. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Such a pleasure to be with you. Wow. Perfect. Thank you so much, sir. I definitely am here to learn. I am sure all the students and educators that join us today from different parts of the world are as well. Um, without further ado, we would we can get into the conversation. People will keep joining in, of course. Uh, we'd love to hear your take first, Professor Ramachandran, about uh, how have you perceived the growth of fintech in the last few years, and how do you see it progressing moving forward? Yeah, so let me first start in, uh, uh, as a professor, uh, you know, it's important to uh, set the ground uh, uh, level in terms of what is fintech. I think that's a fundamental starting point. I'm sure that, uh, you know, many of you have uh, already read about uh, fintech quite a bit, uh, but it's, a, I would call it a more, it's a fancy name of use of technology in financial products and services uh, to make it more efficient, the entire processes. Uh, and um, I think the, the way things have evolved uh, over the last, I would say, uh, 10 odd years uh, is when the, the, it has actually taken off, especially after the 2008 economic crisis. You know, I was a, I was a director at Merrill Lynch. Uh, we saw what happened to Merrill Lynch and the Bank of America takeover and uh, you know, Bear Stearns. I was actually consulting for Bear Stearns as well. And uh, you know what happened to that uh, company. So I think there is a, a tremendous amount of uh, you know, um, uh, information that was kind of uh, missing during that entire process. And so uh, a lot of the startup companies started uh, you know, filling the gaps and holes in terms of the uh, processes that were missing, whether it's in terms of understanding you know, why, did we, why did the mortgage-backed securities, the entire industry kind of collapse? And uh, uh, was it just greed on one hand, or is it the lack of information? So I think it started, the genesis started from there, and that the, around the same time is where you know, Bitcoin and uh, you know, start, the process of that Bitcoin and blockchain started. So it's kind of started, uh, you know, uh, developing around the 2008, nine time frame, and uh, it has just taken off like crazy over the last uh, 10, 11 years. Uh, you know, uh, in the U.S., I have seen, uh, uh, you know, several startup companies, uh, and I have been advising several startup companies, both from a product management perspective as well as from a uh, uh, from a go to market st uh, strategy in terms of what is it that they need to do. And there seems to be a, a tendency for these fintech companies to uh, obviously uh, fill the holes that the big uh, institutional uh, uh, folks are uh, missing out. And this is the process of uh, 
constructive destruction that is happening uh, in the in the entire fintech industry. Uh, and uh, there are uh, close to 10,500 odd, uh, you know, as per the last report that I saw uh, in February 2021, uh, 10,500 odd fintech startup companies in the in the Americas, which includes Canada and the US uh, and Mexico, and then um, about uh, 9,000 odd in uh, Europe. Uh, and about 6,500 odd in the a a Asian region. And uh, so the, the, the growth has been phenomenal uh, to say the least uh, over the last uh, 10, 12 years. And uh, India is obviously no exception. And there are over 2,500 out of the 6,000 odd, 2,500 are based in India, right? And uh, so there is, a, we'll talk more in terms of what, the, what areas specifically they are addressing, but it has been to, uh, provide better customer experience, better uh, process efficiencies, as well as in terms of uh, filling the holes and to support regulatory and compliance uh, demands uh, that came out of the 2008 crisis. So I, I'll stop there in terms of uh, responding to your first question. Uh, there has been, a, and obviously with this growth uh, in the startup venture, obviously the larger institutions have also been uh, un uh, felt the pressure and they have also pivoted and started creating uh, products and services that meet the demands, right? So any kind of financial technology that supports them, and it's a very broad spectrum of financial technologies and uh, the bigger banks and uh, financial institutions have been uh, clearly you know, investing a lot of money and energy in, in that space. And they're, they're creating a collaborative relationship with these startup companies so that they can address the requirements. Um, uh, the create, creating a lot of job opportunities that we'll again address in the in shortly uh, for the young uh, young minds. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Ramachandran. That in, in fact, thank you for taking us back and talking about the 20, 2008 crisis as well. And you were there and witnessed it. And for extensively mentioning the collaboration part, with that, I want to extend the question to Professor uh, McWither as well. Would love to hear your take, sir, that how you have seen the industry grow in particular and where do you see it growing? Um, yeah, I mean, building on, on what Professor uh, Ramachandran said, yes, it's the, there's the fintech sort of, sort of, um, you know, that startup and, and it's everything from startup to enterprise. And then again, I've got some slides I'll show you on that. Um, but it's that, that standalone piece, but what we're seeing now is these, these combinations, they're actually, uh, uh larger enterprises are, are like the banks in Canada, BMO, RBC specifically, um, instead of, you know, doing a bit of development themselves, but then bringing in the best of breed, it, you know, it makes good business sense to find someone who's already developed it. Why would you compete against this new upstart when you can bring them in house? So when we talk about roles in FinTech, it's not always with, it can be with those companies. It can be with the larger uh, institutions as well, but there's some really cool partnerships happening right now. And like I say, without uh, uh, spoiler alert, I'll, 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 I have a slide that sort of talks about some of those relationships going forward. Perfect. Thank you so much for that and setting the context as well, right? And I'm so glad there are more people. I saw the numbers rising as well uh, while the two of you were speaking as well. And uh, please feel free uh, to the audience to make sure you're sending in the questions because we would love to address them as well. Uh, moving quickly to the next question I have for the two of you. Uh, when we speak of a domain growing, that also means opportunities, right? But there's a major gap in terms of skills. Uh, what are the few things that you would like to address? Because both of you come from established universities. That's something they're trying to do. In terms of that, what are the skills that the fintech industry really needs that students should start working on early on, or at least need to be aware of? So Professor Ramachandran, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, so um, I'll probably put in a plug for Jindal School of Banking and Finance in this uh, process. Uh, uh, so when we conceived our uh, undergraduate program in commerce, uh, as well as in the area of finance and entrepreneurship. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, rely on was uh, uh, external studies that have, been, that have been conducted in the last several years, whether it is from the World Economic Forum studies or whether it is from the uh, studies conducted by you know, independent consulting houses like Yan Shen Yang and PwC. And all of them point to a few things in terms of the future work and the skills that are in demand. Uh, Clearly, the area of uh, data and uh, understanding data in its various forms, with, through visual analytics to other uh, you know uh, forms, but also understanding the um, 
the ability to think critically about, and be able to work in teams, uh, which are the softer side of things, uh, are probably more prominent than the hard skills that are required, right? But having said that, uh, we understand that you know the areas of uh, technology-based industries are going to be uh, omnipresent, if you will. Any industry, if you touch, whether it is the manufacturing, retail, agriculture, education, and clearly finance and banking and banking services, it, there is going to be a tremendous influence of uh, uh, technology. Uh, so everyone, whether you are a teacher, whether you are a uh, you know, uh, machinist, whether you are a, you know, a banking professional or investment banker, you need to understand technology. So what we had done was in uh, ensuring that uh, our students, there are three things that we did. Number one is uh, all students as a core foundation, they need to understand technology. Even though they were learning commerce and uh, they were doing BA honors in finance and entrepreneurship, they need to understand what is technology. So the predominant 50, 60% of the new startup companies are all technology based. Uh, so we are uh, emphasizing the use, uh, learning of technology and data and analytics right from the first semester of the program, right? So these are not necessarily uh, you know, uh, engineering students, these are not STEM and uh, science students, but these are commerce and humanity students, and, but we are emphasizing the, uh, you know, the process of knowledge sharing with them on how these emerging technologies impact businesses and what they're like, right? So that's the first thing that the learning process. The second thing is there is a lot of applied learning that we are emphasizing on in terms of ensuring that students learn about uh, the use of technology in a real world setting through simulations and other uh, activities to ensure that they understand how these technologies are going to cha change. And especially from a FinTech standpoint, uh, you know, uh, or cryptocurrency, these are words that are being uh, thrown about. If you ask any 11th or 12th grade student in India, they probably have heard of Dogecoin and, uh, uh, and Tesla and, uh, you know, what uh, Elon Musk is doing, but that, it stands at that level, right? So what we are trying to do is penetrate it down to the, you know, 10,000 foot level, so make a, making sure that they understand what is cryptocurrency, what is blockchain, what is fintech, right? So they need to understand that, and they, we are trying to do that the simulation exercises uh, through case studies and such so that, and then putting them in real startup uh, ventures so that they can learn about these things. Uh, so it's important. And then we are, what we are also trying to do is to ensure that uh, we are bringing a sufficient level of industry inputs into the uh, into the course curriculum from an academic setting standpoint. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, we have people from PTM and some of the uh, you know, uh, other startup companies who come in and regularly interact with the students, right? So we have made it a part of the entire curriculum to ensure that students learn about these things in a more uh, active fashion, right? Um, and so I don't know whether I'm addressing your question very specifically, but the point is that there is a lot of uh, different skills and capabilities that students need to learn. And some of them are hard skills in terms of learning about fintech and learning about payment processing, learning about lending and crowdsourcing. What does that really mean? And how does these new technology services really play a role in those uh, changing process? You know, whether it is you know uh, going digital or how you know uh, make in India processes. All these different uh, programs and policies that have been set in place have a digital component. What is the artificial intelligence policy for India? What does it say and how does it impact you know, new startups or, or the existing uh, large banks and institutions, right? So we kind of emphasize on the policies, the programs that have been put in place by the government, as well as what are the, you know, the, the, the companies doing themselves? What is HDFC doing? What is ICICI Bank doing? What is Punjab National Bank doing? So to give them that insight, helps them understand that there are changing roles uh, in organizations. And uh, be it, well, while they may be, it is not necessarily always uh, around technology and programming and coding, while there are some of that, it is a, there is a lot about the business processes, there is a lot about doing the analysis and the, being able to do the, uh, you know, uh, the business angle of uh, life, right? And so we are emphasizing on that while we, you know, obviously, 
we have science students who you know who are part of our uh, program we are, we are not discriminating against people who are coming from the science background uh, there is a lot, number of science students who uh, you know were part were going through the commerce and humanities program but uh, it is important to you know kind of uh, integrate that in a seamless fashion uh, in terms of what the skills that they learn right and so we and then they can talk more about the types of skills and type of uh, roles that yeah. students can play uh, but uh, broadly speaking it is definitely the education is changing uh, especially at the yeah. bank in finance we have made it a little more future ready so that uh, students are learning about skills that are uh, that are going to be relevant for them irrespective of what industry that they go into yeah. No, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. For that, so uh, and one thing in particular, I want to pull a thread from that you mentioned about uh, uh, creating more awareness. That's important, right? We don't know how to build the skills till we know. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm passing on the same question to you, Professor Keith. So over to you. Um, so yeah, you yeah. muted. Sorry, I have too many buttons on my screen right now. Um, before I get into this, I'm just going to, for, I've had a, people, a few people ask in the, in the chat as well about, so I've got a bunch of slides that I'm just dragging. There's a PDF now that everyone can now download and follow along at home. I can sometimes talk very quickly and I apologize in advance for that, but uh, I'm gonna go through a couple of the points just building on the professor's comments. Um, I'm just gonna do a bit of a screen share right now and that's gonna be uh, this one right here. So, I love what you said about the um, the different roles and the different opportunities. Uh, uh, again, so this is what sort of the Canadian fintech map looks like now. It's you know fintech is it is a massive piece. There are so many, and I, and I get that this 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 is quite small on the screen, but you've got a copy of it, so you'll be fine. Uh, whether it's blockchain, capital markets, finance, lending, borrowing, real estate, it's, it's like saying, you know, it's like saying finance, or like saying consulting, it's, it is a massive, massive uh, area. So um, there's many different areas that you can explore. Uh, and, and then what the question was around those skill sets that are required. So you know, it, it, you know, it's like the HR answer. It depends, right? It's, uh, this is where in, in, in the Canadian market, uh, networking is absolutely critical. And in our market, in my, my view of it, networking isn't about job search. Networking is about research. Uh, finding out what specific skills uh, are going to be required. What is that language? There are some overarching pieces that the uh, professor alluded to, which I agree with 100%. Um, for example, these ones here. So it's it's there are it's 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 a combination. Yes, there is going to be some tech. Obviously, there's going to be some you know knowledge of some coding based on what the job is looking for. And this is where that uh, that uh, research piece is absolutely critical. Um, but time and time again, I I have the the honor of of interviewing students whether or not a student is accepted in the Queen's University in Commerce or the M our MBA program. And it's a balance. So yes, there is some of that technical acumen. Uh, there's knowledge. There's awareness pieces. There are things that uh, you can you can pick up on your own. Uh, Coursera, edX, LinkedIn Learning can help with some of the you know, rudimentary type um, skill sets. But it's that balance too. Uh, I love what you talked about, Professor, around that 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 communication, that working with teams. Um, so much about technology in the business sector is about storytelling. And, you know, and that's been my passion over the years is I, you know, connecting the server room to the boardroom. And that's not an easy skill set. And then people that we see more successful in the fintech area are the ones that can make that. It's not about technology for technology's sake. It's what the, the, how it's affecting a business outcome, a tangible outcome. Why, why should you have one of these at your company? And, and there's a story behind that. So there is that, yes, we talk about, you know, knowledge of AI is, is something looking forward. Be aware of that. That is going to be happening on many different fronts. Um, and of course, some coding skills based on what the role is going to require. But there's communication skills. There's analytical skills. Uh, you alluded to multitasking and working in ambiguous situations. These are, these are skills that the companies can't teach you. Uh, you're going to have to bring that to the table. There's a lot that is going to be new and developing while you're on the role. Um, and that's one of the things you're going to be benefiting from working for these larger firms. But 
but there's certain things you got to have in your back pocket already. So uh, this is just a list of, you know, generally going across the sector as a whole, some commonalities. Every role will be a little bit more specific. But again, what's the thing that I need to do for this one specific role? Research, 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 talking to people at these companies, asking them how they were successful, um, learning about, you know, asking uh, contacts that you've got, you know, about not about what you should do. That's a hard question. They might not know you. It's about their insights and their advice based on their experience and their expertise. That's when the magic happens. And that's when you are better prepared to, um, to apply for these types of roles. So those, those are the hard and fast sort of skill sets that we talk about here at Smith. I'm happy to answer any kind of questions around that. Well, if I may, uh, Keith, just to add on to what you just mentioned, I think you know what uh, people need to recognize is that uh, the entire area of fintech is fairly nascent, right? And so it is just starting out in terms of its uh, journey to uh, being integrated into everyone's uh, psyche. Uh, so if you think about artificial intelligence, it started in 1950s, right? But it has taken this long uh, for it to become part and parcel of our uh, uh, wearable technology and mobile technology and, uh, you know, whatever else that we do has got an AI component into the mix. Likewise, uh, where fintech is, it's a, it's a, initially being driven by the technologists, right? So they, you know, techno as a technologist myself, I have been, I get super excited when I see something new and uh, I, I feel that this is going to be the best thing next to, uh, you know, uh, sliced bread and uh, it never is the case. And that is where the students, you know, of today uh, need to think about not from a purely technological angle, but from the business angle, from the customer angle, uh, in terms of how this is going to help uh, solve a particular problem, uh, how it's going to help the community and the society at large, uh, because there is tremendous potential for sure. But it is the application of these technologies that is really going to make a difference. And, and for that, you do require those communication skills. You do require to be able to talk to the Technologies, this uh, you know the supply chain person. You need to talk to the actual customers, uh, whether it is the vegetable vendor or whether it is the uh, you know the uh, folks who are uh, you know manning the government booths. You need to be able to talk to them and you know at that level and get their what their pain points are and to solve for that is where your uh, magic is going to be. It is not just fintech. Is a you know quote unquote learning about Python and R and stuff like that, that just doesn't, is not going to fly. Uh, it's just going to be a failure. So the ability for this whole area of uh, the blockchain technology, which is a lot of the FinTech is going to be based on, is just that. You have to know what the problems that you're going to solve, where the efficiencies are going to be, you know, uh, you know when, you, when, the, when in India, you're talking about, you know, the, uh, banking the unbanked with 450 million people, who don't have a bank account, how do you solve that? How do you get that access to, uh, to the villagers, you know, who are in the farms every day toiling, and then how are you going to make uh, the transactions easier for them, right? And how do you communicate in their own vernacular? Uh, those are the kind of problems you need to be thinking about rather than thinking about technology for a technology sake. I think that's very important. Even though FinTech is financial technology, it is, way beyond that. And that is where the communication, teamwork, critical thinking, those skills become even more important. So just add to what, uh, that is a fantastic slide actually, Keith. Uh, uh, I, I, my, I had, my, my notes were somewhat different. It looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's how mine all starts. So I'm right with you. I, I, still, I, I still use a pen too, but my mind, I've got the, uh, attention span of a hummingbird so uh, yeah. if i don't put something down on a slide deck again technology like you i'm a technologist i, yeah. I it's it's a it's a it's a blessing and a curse at the same time so yeah exactly and i love what i love what you said about the communication you've got to be able to tell that story and you've got to um across all areas i mean we, we talk a bit about um it's not just technology for technology's sake so the the uh, the other slide I, I like to show here is when going back to what we were talking about before is uh, these partnerships. So again, 
So it's not just the fintech, fintech firms themselves. So again, so Google is helping out uh, BMO. Uh, you've got uh, Zero helping uh, CIBC. But again, this is about, you know, it's not just about the tech. It's, uh, you know, with Google is playing around mobile checking accounts. So this is all end user focused. This isn't just making the bank better. It's like it's, it's human centered design is another skill set. And again, you can bring this from past project management skills. You can bring this from uh, product management opportunities that maybe you've worked in before. Uh, but again, it's about uh, a virtual assistant that is happening at Manuloff right now with uh, Casido, where it's again, it's, it's yes, it's about processes. Sometimes it's about products and sometimes it's about platforms. Where is fintech helping these companies? with a focus, with a nod to the end user. How are you making people's lives easier? We call it, we call it frictionless banking, where it's just, it's, there's a lot of, you know, I was trying to, I was trying to buy something online yesterday using my Google pay. And it was like choking and puking on me. It wouldn't work. And it was just like, this is supposed to be easy. Why am I feeling friction right now? Would someone just, you know, make, this should be so simple. Everything's touch and pay and everything's one click away, but it's not. So, um, so it's not just having the coolest thing and then selling it to people. It's starting with what the problem statement is and then how can we solve that? So that's just something I wanted to build on from our, our previous conversation. But uh, I, I think we're speaking the exact same language, Professor. No, I think that's brilliant. Uh, while the two of us are speaking, I was really enjoying the conversation because I'm rethinking a lot of things. For example, I'm, I can vouch for it, Professor Key, that somebody's listening out there trying to solve the problem. But that problem needs to be put out there. That brings me to my next question. I have personally faced this very often that when I speak about, uh, especially to an Asian parent that, okay, FinTech is a great domain to work in, your kid will do well. The question is, oh, this domain doesn't even exist, to be honest, because they're ignorant about it. And I don't blame them because there's lack of awareness still, like you said, so it's nascent. But what are the few opportunities? Because most of the students here are in the high school, they will want to know. What are the few career opportunities you would like to highlight that are going to be there for them once they work out of college in coming from a FinTech or looking to work in FinTech? So, is that understood Keith or to me? Uh, to both of you, for that matter. Professor you, you, take, you, you take it away, Professor. I'll follow your lead. All right. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm going to assume that all, most of the uh, participants here are based in India. Yes. Uh, so even though I'm based in the U.S., I, will, uh, uh, I teach in India. So I, uh, over the last few years, I have uh, collected enough intelligence about the Indian uh, market. Uh, so I will talk from that perspective. Um, the, the, the industry, the, even though the word fintech it kind of refers to the financial services industry. Uh, so I, I would like to, you know, any, like in any consulting world, we like to create matrix, right? Uh, so if you want to create a matrix of uh, industry domains on the vertical axis, and then in the horizontal axis, all the functional areas. And then on overlay on top of that, all the different types of technologies and other types of uh, areas, right? So if you think about it from the three-dimensional angle for a moment, uh, any forms of this technology nowadays, you've got you know, things like ed tech. You would have heard of the word ed tech, right? Educational technology. So the underlying uh, uh, technologies that are being used are very similar from the from fintech. Uh, reg tech is the regulatory technology. Ag tech, which is the agriculture technology. Insure tech, which is the insurance uh, based technology. So there is, uh, you know, there, uh, and then there's the legal tech or law tech, and that's related to the legal profession in terms of how they, uh, you know, read uh, contracts and uh, uh, through using natural language processing and stuff. Like that. So it, there is a there's a lot of crossover there. So once you are learning about FinTech and the underlying technologies, you are actually can apply the same uh, you know, skills, the hard skills in any of these industries. So it will, it will be relevant uh, in, in uh, any of the industries, agriculture, manufacturing, retail, uh, you know, consumer products, whatever it may be, right? So it's going to be relevant. So while there is, a, and within, uh, within the banking and financial services, whether you are looking at a mortgage service industry or a loan processing industry, uh, crowdfunding, which is becoming more and more popular in India, uh, and then the, the standard you know, banks and commercial banks, investment banks, and uh, you know, retail banks, all those industries uh, are going to be uh, from load processing to deposits to payments, 
uh, it's going to be relevant. Okay, so from an industry perspective, it is going to be. And then in one of the slides that Keith had shown, uh, shown uh, in terms of the functional areas, you know, you are going to be, you can apply this FinTech across accounts, accounting, taxation, you know, GL reporting, uh, reg, reg reporting in terms of uh, uh, other functions that you may you may be doing in terms of treasury functions, right? So you can think across all these different functional areas and uh, and uh, and uh, and be able to apply the fintech in any of those areas, right? Uh, so I we did a study with uh, one of the largest uh, insurance companies uh, in the world uh, a few years back, and we found that they had like total of about 35,000 processes that they had, right? Um, and uh, so they were a you know, standard property and casualty insurance business, uh, very popular in, the, in Japan and other, other, uh, other uh, countries, and obviously in the Americas as well. Uh, and uh, out of these 35,000 processes, we felt that, uh, again, as part of our analysis and study, we felt that there, there are probably about 70 to 80 percent of those processes could be uh, could be uh, transformed digitally, a and b, uh, fintech technologies could be applied in that, right? Which is causing a tremendous amount of uh, process efficiencies uh, and customer experience uh, activity. So, uh, and then we kind of did pilots around their uh, uh, you know claims processing and and such. And we were able to actually turn around the time from 30 days for claim settlements to three days, right? So think about it from an end user perspective. If I was uh, having a, a claims to be processed, uh, my, if let's say we get into a motor accident and then we wanted to uh, apply for claims, uh, instead of waiting for 30 days for the check to arrive from the bank, if I could get the money transferred into my bank account in three days time, that is a tremendous amount of fr friction being removed. You cannot go completely frictionless, but what you're doing is you are improving the efficiency. And what is happening in the back end is applying a lot of the FinTech uh, you know, techniques, if you will, both from an AI perspective, as well as from an automation, uh, robotic process automation perspective, as well as using standardized uh, uh, FinTech techniques, if you will, in terms of payments and so on and so forth. So I, I'm just using that as an example to demonstrate that you can cut across all functional areas, right? And then from a purely technology uh, standpoint, uh, you, you can apply FinTech across and learn about whether it's cybersecurity uh, fundamentals, about intrusion detection services or whatever, or through other types of typical programming, solidity for blockchain or Ethereum and uh, the fiber network that you can do, you can learn about those things as well, right? So you can become an architect, designer, coder, whatever it may be, right? So there is tremendous amount of opportunities in terms of where you can fit in, uh, you know, learning from this. Uh, I just did a search yesterday at indeed.com and at nokri.com in India. And what I found is that, I'm just reading out, there are over, uh, just in LinkedIn, there are over 3,000 jobs, 3,000 plus jobs on LinkedIn uh, for the FinTech related jobs in India, right? And at nokri.com, uh, again, this is just based on uh, basic search, there are over 100,000 or one lakh jobs in India. And it, it, it doesn't say that you need to have an engineering background. You know, it cuts across from cybersecurity, blockchain, uh, business, you know, developing business models, risk and compliance uh, and quants, that is people who are doing the portfolio management, investment analysis, those kind of stuff. And uh, because they want people with all levels of education, all fields of study, right? So that is the opportunity that abounds right now. And so one needs to understand that this is the future. So what we are talking about is the future. So you need to ensure that if you are, uh, you know, if you are a high school student or if you are a graduate student, you need to know about fintech. If you do know about fintech, that's what I tell my students. You know, you are already in the one percent of the population that know probably more than others, right? And so you are, a, you have a leg up, and so that is how you need to think about it. So I'll stop there. Keep. Yeah, no, I, I I love what you say that, and it's about how does it fit in and the cross pollination. So, I mean, I look at things like 
when we look at technology in uh, in our market, I mean, basically the five key buckets. So we got you know services and consulting, networks, uh, software, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, electronics and hard uh, hardware and information management. And you can see some of the big players. Some of these are startups. Some of these are enterprise wide. So, but if you just do it again, if you do a bit of a drill down to see where fintech fits into it, under the software side of it alone. So you got your, to, to what the professor is talking about, your prop tech, clean tech. You can bolt the word tech on everything. Uh, law tech is another big thing we're seeing. We are going through all the different briefs and all the different uh, publications, you know, having AI help lawyers is a huge, huge thing that's developing now in our market. Fintech is, is just one of those uh, with some of the big players. And then as we talked about before, just within fintech now, um, there are all these players. So again, that 1% piece, you're, you're absolutely, you've hit it on the head. But the nice thing is, uh, if you have some, oops, go back to it. I'll get to that one in a second here. Um, but if you have that piece around FinTech, now you can look at all the other different techs that you can be, be valuable on. You know, you know, what company out there does not have a finance department? Nobody, right? So if you've got some sort of FinTech, the amount of the different markets and different areas you can move into uh, are huge. I mean, th this is, you know, maybe financial services institutions are the heaviest user of FinTech. But again, uh, retail commerce is going to be massive. Of course, hospitality will be another piece that is looking for optimization there. There's a lot of, you know, we have got these company names that you see in front of you here in these buckets, but the vast majority of them span many others as well, too. So uh, if you're, if you've got a visibility and competency in one, you can move to the others. If you've been experienced somewhere else, then getting in the FinTech isn't, uh, uh, isn't too far of a reach for you. And then we talk about what that can look like. So the ecosystem of FinTech, um, you know, there's many different ways of looking at it. Again, this is about, I love what you talked about with, with those roles. It's not about really about the company. It's like, what do you want to achieve? What what does success look like for you? And is it in you know, the venture capital side? Is it in that startup entrepreneurial culture? Is it in more of the established financial institutions? They all are playing with each other and the startup can support a venture or, or provide opportunities uh, for new processes and products for financial institutions. And you know, it's, it's a mutualistic relationship. So it's, it's more about what you want to achieve and what is that area? Um, uh, areas that are being invested in Canada right now, this is what's happening last year. I mean, uh, payment systems, lending, back office processes are the lion's share. Uh, insurance, digital currencies, yeah, blockchain, uh, cryptocurrencies, that's coming on very strong. This is where investors are putting their money. So if you're looking for where opportunities lie, you follow the money, right? Um, so this is what's happening in our current uh, market right now, but you can see it's just this huge, huge range of opportunities. So um, fintech is one of those techs that has probably, um, again, it's that sort of, I would say smaller percent, but I think it's got probably the most flexibility to uh, to move into other areas. And if you've got those skills, and it is and it isn't any specific one to your point, Professor. It, it, you know, yes, if you're an engineer, that's great. Yes, if you've got some coding, that's fantastic. But it's really about that whole package. And are you bringing everything to the table? And how are you going to? What do you bring into that company? Uh, um, and, and what is the problem that they're trying to solve? And what is the problem that you can solve yourself for those firms? So, um, you know, that just wanted to confirm that point. But I, I think again, once again, I think we're perfectly aligned. It's like we shared our notes before this talk. I love it. <laughs> no, but you both made a very strong case about that. I think gives a lot of perspective to a lot of people as well. Uh, I want to bring this closer home. Uh, I would love for both of you to talk about the courses being offered at your respective schools, right? Uh, Professor Ram, can you just highlight the courses being offered at Jindal School of Banking and Finance? Sure. Um, there are, um, so we have, uh, mandatory courses uh, or core courses that we call them uh, on emerging technologies where we touch on uh, artificial intelligence, fintech and blockchain and IoT, which is the internet of things. So these, what I call is a three-legged uh, moving stool uh, is what is driving the future of industries, right? And we want, we offer that as a, a required course for all our undergraduate students uh, especially we're doing the <clears throat> commerce education and uh, the, uh, uh, the BA in uh, finance and entrepreneurship. They have to take that course. In addition, they have to take courses, uh, again, foundational courses on analytics. Uh, and uh, we uh, teach them about uh, uh, 
you know, visual analytics, use of, uh, you know, how, how do you apply business logic and how do you rationalize and develop a storyline or a storyboard, if you will, uh, you know, keep talked about, uh, you know, uh, you know, developing storyboards and uh, that, that is important, right? It is, it is one thing to say that why there is more uh, gender crimes in certain parts of the country and not, but then we need to show them, uh, show that in, uh, in a graphical forms and charts and graphs is one thing, but also to go beyond that to say why it is happening. So that is where we bring in the interdisciplinarity of social sciences into the mix, whether it is the socioeconomic conditions, it is the historical perspective of why that is happening. We do that with a lot of case examples, right? And so that is the, the whole aspects of analytics is a core course. Uh, we also offer a number of, uh, you know, um, electives uh, with blockchain and cryptocurrency, artificial intelligence in business. We talk about, you know, payment processing, uh, that's an elective uh, using FinTech. Uh, there are other types of, crypt, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies, uh, that's part of the you know elective courses as well, uh, uh, and then the, the analytics we have got different actuarial analytics and insurance analytics. So we we have different aspects of that. Uh, uh, digital transformation of banks banks is another you know elective course that the students can take. Uh, so all these they essentially builds up their repertoire of uh, knowledge, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And I think one of the questions that was asked is which domain is more critical than technology? Or I, I didn't quite understand the question, but uh, you know any domain is fine. You know it doesn't have to be related to only lending or payments or uh, mortgage servicing or uh, and such. Uh, you know the, the, there has been a tremendous impetus right now. Uh, you know with the the government of India with their uh, uh, NCBC program with the Jandan Yojana program. There is, you know, the, the expanding the entire digital India program uh, significantly that, you know, you are going to require all sorts of uh, skill set, whether it is the through the UPI framework or it is the India stack that has been created. You need to understand what that really means from a business standpoint. And so understanding the domain across these different areas is important. Uh, one, one of the other uh, electives that we offer, and we get into some level of detail, is the uh, is the cyber security aspects of it. Because you, as we becoming more and more digital, as you know, the cyber security every eight seconds there is a hack somewhere in the world, right? So you cannot but learn about uh, you know uh, detection prevention uh, of these uh, cyber security threats and attacks, you know. Uh, whether it's ransomware or whether other types of uh, things, you need to understand what this means and how do you protect yourself against that. As business managers, as uh, startup venture venture capital, you are going to learn about them. And so those are the kind of courses. And then I get talked about some of the applied learning process that we go through. So that is kind of things that we do cover uh, in general school of banking and finance. Um, and obviously a lot of this is important from a very practical standpoint, rather than just purely in the classroom. So the emphasis on that a lot. Um, absolutely. So I think what you mentioned that made me think about the fact that back at school, when we were learning at university, that was not even a subject, right? Now we're talking about domains, but that's wonderful. So thank you for sharing that. Coming to you, uh, Professor Keith, we'd love to hear what the Smith School of Business has been doing in this domain. Excellent. Well, I mean, so again, we are the School of Business. So at Queen's University, there is actually a School of Computing for more of those hard and fast skills. And we've got a very, very prominent uh, engineering faculty as well, too. But it's bleeding into the on the uh, on the business side as well. So as, as early as second year in our commerce or underground program, we are doing introduction to uh, digital businesses and technologies. And we've got a lot of electives that we partner with the uh, School of Computing as well, too. Um, in addition to that, you can actually have uh, specialties. So if someone wanted to specialize in digital, uh, then we've got, again, introduction uh, to data management. We're actually bringing in, I love this course, coding literacy for managers. You're not going to be the coder, but you understand the language of it. When you're about to assign work, when you're about to lead a team, do you understand whether it's going to take them a day, a week, or a month to do that? Can you set real ex realistic expectations? Uh, if you could be the best manager, but if you don't speak the language of your team, uh, there's going to be some issues. Uh, project management, again, every tech project, I mean, software development, I mean, pe people are familiar with, you know, at, you know with uh, waterfall project management, but agile was really born from the software 
projects where it's a very iterative process that's kind of messy, uh, constant check-ins. So teaching those uh, those overall skills are, are critical. Uh, so we've got them now built into the curriculum. Um, in addition to those, we're actually, because of, of the trend that we're seeing right now, we're actually built new programs. So we've got our, you know, I'm thankful I'm an MBA grad from the School of Business here. Um, we have a master's of management in artificial intelligence. We have our first one globally. We have a master's of management in innovation and entrepreneurship. We're actually kind of be coming up with a new master's of digital product management. So we actually have degrees and master's programs designed specifically for this space of which FinTech will play a piece of it. But uh, it's what we see as the future. And it's, uh, it is such a, such a large spectrum with so many opportunities uh, we're building it now, not, not necessarily into our, we are building into our curriculum, but we're actually building curriculums that are strictly focused on that uh, for those that really want to do that deep dive. So again, for someone who comes in from, um, you know, a, a, a health background or maybe banking, but they don't have the tech side, they can come in and do these courses that now they can play on their strengths and add this lovely bolt on of what that looks like in the tech space and then go back to their institutions in a different role or move on to something else and have that choice of, do I wanna get into a startup? Do I wanna get into a scale up? Do I wanna to go to the, the large company or institution? Um, they all need you. So uh, uh, we've actually, we've, we've embedded it, but also we've done a lot of creation around new opportunities. Uh, Abhishek, uh, one other thing that I would like to point out is in addition to the undergraduate programs, just like uh, what Keith mentioned, we do have uh, you know, a spe specialized uh, master's program as well, which focuses on uh, fintech and data regulations that combines the, the demand uh, for understanding what are the various financial and banking regulations uh, in the advent of these new uh, you know, areas, uh, whether it is related to fintech or digital payments or cryptocurrencies, how, how is the, you know, the global, uh, you know, financial authorities dealing with it, but at the same time, how is RBI and uh, the uh, Ministry of Finance, how are they dealing with it? So we have uh, created a master's program that just addresses the FinTech and data regulation per se. Uh, in addition, we are also have uh, you know, a master's program in areas of finance and risk management that also covers the FinTech aspects of things. Uh, and, and then uh, in, in, in ensuring that uh, as we as the number of people starts uh, you know growing who are going to be using these financial services, there is another element to this, and that is the element of uh, behavior and psychology, right? Uh, which is not being thought about uh, as much, uh, but that becomes extremely important from an investment management uh, banking standpoint as well as from a portfolio management standpoint for individual uh, individual customers, as well as for institutional customers. Uh, how do, uh, the, the rationality of human beings to deal with money uh, has been totally misunderstood, right? So we have masters and uh, you know, uh, you know, graduate level programs that focuses on finance and uh, behavioral sciences uh, to ensure that People, so once a student uh, you know, graduates from a FinTech or a finance program, uh, they are able to you know, take on these graduate level uh, programs of study that touches on these very specific areas, uh, whether it is FinTech, whether it is you know, uh, uh, related to behavioral sciences and finance uh, and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to lay that out that there is a career path that can be brought out from an academic standpoint for the students to grow as well from an undergraduate to a graduate. Um, that's a lot of food for thought for everyone, for sure. I mean, with Professor Key talking about coding uh, literacy and behavioral finance. So I think that's very important for us too. And I'm really happy that this is being talked about and universities are offering that. Uh, on the closing note, like I would love to hear your perspective that uh, both the universities are right, doing wonderful work. What is exactly the kind of student you're looking for? Any particular requirements that you need to meet? So Professor Ramana Chandra would like to go first. So we are looking for people who are articulate, people who are well-read, and people who can uh, navigate the gray. Uh, and when you see navigate the gray means who are not uh, you know, um, stuck to their rigid uh, uh, thoughts, uh, if you will, right? Because the life is evolving and we want you to 
uh, experience the life to its fullest. And the way you do that is expanding your horizons uh, and uh, changes that, uh, you know, the only constant that we have in life. And so you need to be able to adapt and accept that change, uh, be it in a business environment, be it in a family business, be it in a corporate uh, setup. Uh, you need to accept that there is going to be change, right? Uh, you, you can, the, the, the idea of, uh, you know, being in one cushy job for the rest of your career is, uh, is becoming thinner and thinner. Even in, in the traditional uh, countries like Japan, uh, those are no longer whole good, right? So you just need to be aware of uh, career changes and be able to adapt to these changes. So what we are looking for in our students are primarily that. If you uh, you, you know, you could be from a science background, you could be from a humanities background or from a commerce background, it doesn't matter. As long as you know your subjects and you have a keen passion for learning, right? That's a, that is a fundamental thing. And the able, ability to communicate and be able to both from a return and verbal standpoint, the ability for you to talk and uh, express your ideas clearly, uh, very important uh, uh, to be successful, I believe. Of course, a lot of that is also we coach them in the class. If you don't know coding, if you want to get into coding, we have you know student society, student-run societies that teaches them coding if they want to do that. If people want to learn about French or German or Spanish, we have you know language schools that uh, you know that they can go to. Uh, but those are things that they can learn as part of the college process, right? It is. But when we get in the high school students, what we are looking for is people who are willing to uh, think uh, with multiple uh, multiple ways of thinking and as well as being able to communicate and have a passion for whatever they want to pursue, right? Uh, some people are not at all decided as to what they want to do after their undergraduate program. That is totally all right. Uh, we understand that. And so that is why we provide the, the mentorship and support for them to you know take the path that they want to take. Uh, but it is important for them to be able to have those fundamental soft skills, I would say, rather than the hard skills. Perfect. Uh, thank you for that. For coming to me, Professor Keith. Yeah, I love it. I mean, it's it's about those soft skills. So again, these are just sort of three stories of three students we've had over the past years. Um, don't have to have it all figured out. Uh, I coach students in first year that don't know. I coach students. I coach EMBA students who are 47 years old who haven't figured it all out yet. But it's got to be that the, you know, having a passion for the art of the possible, what what can be achieved. Uh, and uh, I mean, the way I like to sum it up is that when at Smith, at, at our school of business, when again, I'm unlucky enough to be part of the admissions committee. Um, yes, there is that overarching, you got to have certain level of marks to get in, in, in from an, or an equivalency in, in the Canadian market. Uh, that takes us from so we start off with 25,000 applicants for 500 positions every year. And 25,000 goes down to 5,000 on marks. And that changes a little bit every year. Um, but what's more important, that 5,000 that goes down to 500 is based on your personal statement of experiences. It's, it's, it's a letter you write that people like me read. I don't, when I'm reading that letter and we're saying yes or no, it has not, I don't know your marks. I don't know if you had a, an 85 average or a 95 average. I've said no to people with 95s and yeses to 85s. Um, I want to know what you're going to contribute. I want to know what you're willing to step into. I want to know about your resilience. Uh, how are you going to see, how are you going to make everyone around you succeed? Uh, uh, we've talked about team over and over again in today's, which is, which is absolutely critical. That's something I can't teach you. That's something that uh, we can develop more, but you got to have that spirit in you. So uh, when I look at these three students and I've worked with, with, worked with all three, um, this is what they had. And then they were, they were like sponges. They would take, you know, it wasn't always an easy ride, but they had that resilience and that willingness to learn. Um, and that, especially, especially in the technology side, is a, is a critical skill that you need to have. But it's not all about the marks. 
I'm so glad you ended with that note, uh, Professor Keith, because that is the misconception here, especially in the subcontinent. Uh, I think one major takeaway I have from this great conversation I had with the two of you is uh, that we've grown up telling, you know, you have to think outside the box. My question always is, why is there a box in the first place? Because <laughs> we have to remove it. That's how we move forward. But absolutely, thank you so much to the two of you. And thank you so much to both the Queen's University and Upi Jindal, because uh, this conversation wouldn't have been possible without the two of you. And I'm sure everyone got to take away a lot from it. I certainly did. So uh, thank you so much. And we'd love to wish you a great day ahead because it's morning for you now. And uh, for everyone, if you want to reach out, uh, at, sir, would you like to post your email IDs there? So yeah, if anyone who's got the, uh, the, the handout I sent has my LinkedIn uh, right. on the first page, uh, happy to reach out on LinkedIn and continue the conversation. Um, I'll do my best to answer your questions where I can. Wonderful. Hey, Abhishek, if, uh, if any of the students have uh, any questions, uh, you know, we have got another three or four minutes, so we can take Absolutely. a couple of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, sir. We'll... Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, does anyone have any particular question? Because this is the perfect time for you to get those answered. We, 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 we load them all to sleep. I think uh, Ferozi Tata, so raise yeah. that. Okay, yes, there's a question about scholarships. Are there any scholarship programs available? Always. <laughs> still... it, it, uh, yeah, it depends. Uh, do your research, go online. Uh, yes, it's, um, we, as with any school, there's always going to be something available, but it's um, do your research, find out what's appropriate and um, connect through the appropriate offices. And there's, there's always opportunities. You just need and, to... the, and the same here at uh, OP Jindal Global University as well. Uh, there are a number of different scholarships, uh, uh, both at the time of entry as well as uh, after that. And uh, in addition to that, if students want to take up uh, you know, research and student research assistantship positions, uh, we offer a stipend for that as well. But those are a shorter time duration. Uh, and uh, for uh, people who do take up the BCom program or the BAFNE program, which is a finance and entrepreneurship program, uh, internship is mandatory. Uh, so uh, at least two internships are mandatory. So what that means is that many of these internships are paid internships, so they can earn while they study. So there are several of those kind of programs as well. So it's a combination of uh, different things, both from a scholastic, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, scholarships as well as in terms of uh, other types of scholarships you know if you are a, a national level you know tennis player or something like that i'm sure there are some sports scholarships available uh, you know and so on and so forth so there is uh, you know uh, uh, there are different opportunities and that we can definitely discuss. So I can say it's always and multiple of those available so certainly you have to make sure. Uh, 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 absolutely for deserving candidates the uh, uh, doors are and windows are wide open. Any entrance exam for application, I can actually say there is JSAT, this exam you have to get for OP Jindal for sure. Uh, is there any particular exam, Professor Keith, for uh, um, Smith, Smith School of Business other than IELTS and TOEFL? Uh, I, I can't really speak to that. I'm not on the academic, okay. on the entrance okay. side of it as well, too. Um, I think there, uh, I, I will drag into the link sort of a, uh, a link to the website that explains sort of the process and walk you through it as well. But um, yeah, I, was, I remember uh, correctly last time visiting your website, there was only a requirement of English language test for Indian students. There was no other particular exam. If I, I would, I would, I would, I would assume that as well too. Yeah, I think I don't think okay. there's any specific thing we make here right now. Well, we'll 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 test you a lot when you get here. Don't worry about it. Perfect, wonderful. Uh, with that, I want to just thank you once again for your time. Uh, for the rest of the questions, we cannot really address. Uh, because of the paucity of time. Uh, so you can certainly mail to us either to Milo or to either of the professors and we'll be more than happy to address. But thank you so much uh, to the both of you. Uh, really appreciated you being here. Have a lovely day ahead. Thank you so much. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you, uh, Professor Ramachandran. I learned so much from you today. Uh, it was an absolute honor to work with you and uh, Abhishek, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Abhishek and uh, Keith and uh, the, all the participants. Uh, for uh, listening patiently and hopefully you got a uh, little bit out of this conversation and of course I did and uh, so hopefully we can continue the discussions uh, beyond this particular forum. Thank you and uh, have a fantastic evening. Good night. Good night and good day. Bye-bye. Yeah,
Bye-bye.